mother goes like you used to. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children, she didn't know what to do. She gave them some broth without any bread, whipped them all soundly and sent them to bed. Were they bad? They must have been bad. Read another one, Mommy. Okay, one more, but then it's bedtime. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to fetch her poor dog a bone. But when she came there, the cupboard was bare. And so, the poor dog had none. Mommy, what will we do if our cupboard was bare? Okay, we've looked into the face of hunger and extreme poverty. So what are the things we need to consider along the pathway of ending hunger in Northeast Alabama? We'll need to discover who are the poor and how they get that way. If there's enough food on the planet for everyone, we need to figure out how to get it to people. Do we know how and where to get the help when it's needed? Yeah, you know, if we can find the services that are available, then we'll know the ones that are not. You know, that holes in the safety net thing. I think we'll need to identify the good stuff that's already being done to help people and find out how we can do more. What about if we could go back when times were slower and people were happier? My grandparents always had a, a garden at their house and I loved eating there as a child. It just seems like the food tasted better at Grandma's. I think we need to get a look at the bigger picture because feeding people today is not going to solve the problem for the future. There's so much to learn about NAFTA and CAFTA trade agreements. I went to Honduras in February to train people how to do my job, and in August I was laid off. Governments have a lot to do with it. I don't understand it all yet, but I do know that every law they make in Washington will eventually affect me. Hi, I'm Matt. And I'm Dustin. We're just two of over 60 college students who have began a journey into hunger. A journey to understand its effects, to ask the question, who's in jeopardy? and a search for some answers. Hunger in America shows up in many ways, but it's hidden. Hidden sometimes by the victims themselves. Pride and denial will keep us from seeking help until it's critical. A guy loses his job to outsourcing at age 45. He's got six months of unemployment insurance. However, insurance is only 45 to $220 per week, depending on how much he makes. For many, the job that we're trained for is no more. He will literally have to recreate his life and provide for his family in six months. They usually settle for a job paying far below the job they lost. He will most likely never reach his previous level of income. A young mother flees her abusive husband. She and the kids have nothing but the clothes on their back. Without family who is able and willing to help, she's in trouble quick. It is not easy starting over from nothing, especially with kids to be responsible for. The process to get help is tedious and humiliating. The United States is the largest and most efficient food producers in the world. Yet each year, more than 35 million Americans are threatened by hunger. Including 13 million children. The United States is the only industrialized country in the world that tolerates widespread hunger within its borders. Poverty and hunger in America is also hidden by those of us who are not in need. So our purpose here is to bring awareness to the issue. And to learn and highlight what is being done here and elsewhere. We want to share some ideas about what can be done. And begin the movement toward making poverty history, poverty, history, history in our generation. Man, I can't believe some of the stuff that happened to those people. I know, it was crazy. I wonder if everyone knows about this. I don't know, well, we need to find out. We do need to find out. Let's take it to the streets. Excuse me, sir. Yeah. Can we ask you a few questions? Yeah, I guess so. Okay. All righty. All right, we're here with uh, Mr. Philip Johnson. Whitney Glover. Wayne Willis. Mr. Mr. Sam Dobbs. 
I'm Ben Knox. Okay, we're going to ask you a few questions about hunger. All right, see, see what we can get out of you. All right, first of all, 30,000 people, okay, are affected by hunger, die of hunger, actually, all right, across on a planetary basis every day, month, week, or year. I would probably, I'd probably say a week. I guess year. Say week. Probably day. Week. I don't know. 30,000 a week. Week, well, that's you know, it's not, oh, a ba that's not a bad guess, but actually, 30,000 yeah. a day. That's crazy. In one day. Yeah. One How does day? that make you feel that 30,000 people falling over dead from hunger each day? I would think there's, there should be more that we as Americans should do for them. Exactly. I mean, do you think this is a big issue in our area? Um, no, not necessarily. Not really. but I'm, sure, I'm sure there are people. Right. But well, it's not, I don't think it's like the widespreadness, right. well, the vastness. What, what, county, what county are you from? Jackson County. Jackson County? Yeah. Okay. How many, how many, what, what percent of students do you think are on uh, free lunch in Jackson County? I don't know. Probably one, two percent maybe. One or two percent. Oh, yeah. no. wow. Yeah, I'd say around 40 percent. Around 30 percent. I would say about 50 percent. I think uh, there, there's many days that, that students come to school, not necessarily here at college, but, you know, and smaller right. children that come to school hungry. Ooh, uh, 62. That's a lot. That's close. close. It's pretty, pretty close. close. 59. Close. 59. 59. That, that's sad. I mean, how does that, I don't, how does that make you feel? You know, that's terrible. That makes me feel bad. That's, I mean, 59% of the students, you know, that's more than, it's more than half, you know. I know it you is. go to math class, so you know. <laughs> yeah, right. you, know you know. That's more that's, than half. I mean, yeah. I mean, that's a surprisingly high number to me. I would have, I would have thought in this county and the surrounding areas, the businesses, I would have thought there'd been more. Some, that, once again, more that we could do exactly. to help these kids. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's absolutely amazing yeah. to you know to even fathom that 59 percent of the people of the children that go to school here, just in the northeast Alabama, are going to school on free lunches because yeah. you know there you can't afford there anything. Be more. There should never be a child in this area with all the successful people and business around here. No child should ever go hungry. Exactly right. Do you know that, uh, I mean, how many million Americans do you think are affected by hunger each year? I, I, couldn't, I couldn't tell you. Yeah. I would think we would have a significantly lower number than other countries. Right. 28 million. Um, I was thinking more percentage, about 10 percent. but it's, it's still high, though. It's 35 million people 35 are affected million. by hunger in America. That's like 13 million children yeah. that are that, going to bed hungry. That, that's just utterly ridiculous it for it should, it should Americans. For, for Americans just to stand aside and allow that to happen. That disappoints me significantly. He was disappointed. Significantly disappointed. Let's check back with the class. Let's do. We're here with the Mappy Project. We're gonna find out what their goal is in our, in our, in our project to end hunger here. All right, guys. If you would, just tell us a little bit about what the Mapping Project is all about here. We're the Mapping Project organizers. Our goal is to make a brochure available to the public with a list of agencies. Right now we're getting a list of agencies that are ready to give help to those who need it. We're going to organize the agencies so that people can locate them. And the brochure will serve everyone of all levels of income. We feel this project is an important community asset because it puts resource information into the hands of every family. We interrupt this program to bring you a news bulletin. In the fall of 2005, our predecessors began looking at the issues surrounding people in need. It was discovered that the community resource directory for both Jackson and DeKalb counties were sadly out of date. This created hardships for those organizations who are in the business of helping people to get their clients the help they need. They also discovered that information on where to go for help was not readily available to the general public. It was their intention to help close up some of the gaps, but it did not go well for their attempts. We now know that miracles were in the process. Through a unique program funded by the United Way in Marshall County and in Huntsville, we are proud to announce the coming of 211, first call for help. Just like 411 or 911, when you dial 211, you will get a resource worker who will be able to tell you where to go in your community for the help that you need. When the service is up and running, everyone will be able to get free information and referrals concerning food, housing, clothing, utilities, child care, education, health services, legal aid, emergency assistance, mental health, substance abuse, child and spousal abuse, and other community information. 
We are very excited about this development and look forward to this community service coming online later in 2007. I think we'll need to identify the good stuff that's already being done to help people and find out how we can do more. All right then, let's take a look at some of the things that have already been done. Come along with us for a journey into a little Sand Mountain history. The Tennessee River nurtures the plateau of Sand Mountain, and the people who live here feel the kinship, more strongly perhaps at times than with their flatland fellow Alabamians. Most of the old timers migrated down from the hills of Tennessee and Georgia, neither more than 50 miles away. The terrain and the sandy soil were never conducive to the large scale plantation agriculture of their neighbors to the south. So the mountain plateau became a mecca for small family farms, became by some accounts the most densely populated farming region in America, producing soybeans, vegetables, and a strong sense of closeness among family and neighbors. Farming has fallen on hard times of late, and so all too often have the people. But despite that, in fact, perhaps because of it, the neighborliness remains. He's been called the Pope of Sand Mountain, an unlikely title, perhaps, for a man who has continued to live no more than an hour's drive or so from the country community where he and his twin brother and fellow minister grew up, and who works with churches whose congregations on any given Sunday might fit comfortably on one pew. But Dorsey Walker has quietly gained something of a national reputation among Methodists as a wheeler dealer of sorts a man with imagination and an uncanny ability to match resources with the needs of the community. He directs the Upper Sand Mountain Parish, a cooperative of 10 small area churches set up in the late 1960s to do just that. It's just before sunrise in Chattanooga, but Donna and Ricky Ball have been up for hours. They drove from Sand Mountain this morning to bring their son, Chris, for surgery. Chris, like his father, has an inherited eye disorder that will require the removal of his lenses. His vision will eventually be in the normal range, but there will be limits to physical activity. The kinds of limits that have contributed to a lack of employment options for Ricky and the financial hardships that have resulted for his family. A family that worked extremely hard but a family that uh, never really had some of the breaks and opportunities that, that they deserve. I just couldn't, you know, feel too good about myself. Uh, you know, most anywhere that I went because of the uh, place that we lived and all that. And I, I done already checked into it. I went to FHA and they told me what I had to have and I just wasn't no way I could come up with that kind of money. The Heart and Hand housing program, which began in 1984, makes use of donated labor from church groups, from local women who, in another example of synergy, also learn construction skills, and from the recipients themselves. Uh, we put it together so that the program does not charge interest. Uh, the family moves in, they uh, pay for the cost of materials over a period of time, and the home is theirs. Ricky, is this kind of a big day? Yeah, it sure is. What does it mean to you? Means having a place to live for a change. There's a whole lot of people help us here lately, you know. We're really proud of it. And we feel really good uh, about those families and those kids, and hopefully that in some way we will play the little part in helping them to get a better uh, notion of, of who they are and of what their life can be. I said, how did you manage to get all these good-looking girls to help you up there? They get up on top of that house, working just like men. I said, I've never seen a woman on top of the house before in my life. Volunteers literally come from all over the country and sometimes beyond to work with the Sand Mountain Parish. On this particular afternoon, they are repairing William Potter's roof. 
All I've got to live on is Social Security. I don't know what it means to work. But I don't know what I'd have done. Because I didn't have the money to buy the shingles. Okay, we'll cut these cabbage at the ground. The next day, they may be gathering surplus vegetables for distribution to food banks, something they call gleaning. Uh, gleaning is an Old Testament concept. Uh, initially, it was an awareness that we had farmers who would be more than happy to gill vegetables that they had grown uh, to feed families who needed it rather than to have it wasted. So one year, we moved uh, over a million pounds of vegetables from the mountain alone. This is an old church building, and uh, we're uh, renovating the building to put in a small commercial cannery. It's rather rustic now, it doesn't look too good, but uh, there are plans. But what we want to do here is to uh, be able to employ some low-income family people and to um, uh, process some of those vegetables and make them available to nonprofit feed programs. Uh, we look forward to getting it together and, and, uh, and seeing it work. As you can see, the Upper Sand Mountain Parish is a multifaceted ministry. We want to emphasize how cool it is, small groups, churches, getting out there to do a greater good. The temple has been set. The Upper Sand Mountain Parish has spent nearly the past 30 years working out the bugs and creating a ready-to-go example that can be duplicated in your community. In fact, this ministry has seeded many other works, and we're going to be hearing about one in Kentucky. But first, let's take a look at the Upper Sand Mountain Parish of today. This ministry consists of four components, each one specializing in connecting needs with resources. There are now three stores named the Better Way Shops. As Dorsey would say, we can do it a better way with people working together. There are two locations that look like beautifully appointed retail shops, and the third is a bargain hunter's delight called the 50 cent store. Their combined monthly intake averages $20,000, which goes to support ministry and pay the wages of its employees. Store clerks are hired from the growing list of needy families and are trained in merchandising, sales, and cashiering. The second component is the food pantry. When folks have a need, they begin with a counseling session, which determines how best to serve each client. Some need food, some need help with utilities, some need medicine. When you come to the food bank, you are given a number of points based on your situation and the number of people in your family. With these points in hand, you do your own shopping for just what you need. This method is designed to foster a sense of pride and dignity. The food bank serves an average of a thousand people every month. The cannery is a unique part of this ministry. With plants donated locally and labor provided by 200 plus volunteers, a crop of organic vegetables are grown and canned for use throughout the year. The harvest is so plentiful that the Upper Sand Mountain Parish sends some of the products to soup kitchens in neighboring metropolitan communities. In 2005, nearly 3,000 quarts of stone soup and sauerkraut were produced. In 1986, um, I began uh, working with the Christian Church in Kentucky, the Christian Church of Disciples of Christ. And uh, I was the minister for Kentucky Appalachia. We were looking for ways to integrate uh, community and church. And Garrett County Cooperative Parish was, um, was started uh, with the help of uh, Dorsey Walker. He came up and spent several days with myself and the leaders of the cooperative parish, uh, helping to uh, encourage them uh, and to help convince them that it was something that the church should do and that, uh, that the parish model was the way to go because it didn't focus on a single denomination, it focused on a geographic area. In this case, it was a county. It is, uh, it is helped uh, feed families, uh, with direct service needs and helped clothe families uh, that would be in the uh, many hundreds, perhaps thousands, uh, over, the, over its lifetime. Uh, the other areas that it worked in were uh, helping start ecumenical youth ministries, uh, senior citizens programs. It was the catalyst for the Habitat for Humanity in that county. 
The fourth component of the Upper Sand Mountain Parish is the Heart and Hand Ministry. It's similar to the Habitat for Humanity organization, but locally autonomous. Listen to Dorsey as he speaks to rural ministers about building houses. Uh, the beauty of it is we're in the process of deeding of the 44 houses, the 14th house, to families who have paid them off. Okay? Now the last several years, it's $100. Uh, you've got to be able to pay $100 a month. When they make the payment at the end of the year, we return to the sponsored church one half of the money that the family has paid. So if the family pays $100 a month, we get our $1,200, they get six, we keep six for the development of the project. You may know that low income is 80%, I think I remember right, it's, it's 70 or 80% of the median income. I think it's 70% of the median income is low income. Very low income is 50% of the median income or less. The new category, extreme low income, is 30% of the median income or less. When we documented it for them, nobody on earth, he said, would ever do it. Seven of the eight families are extreme low income. Now these families have a difficult time. If you used any make sense sort of idea that some responsible lending institution would follow, you would never deal with the people we deal with. I mean, probably we've got six or seven that right now are way behind. I keep nudging them along, and I know that probably when they get a tax return check in January, we'll get caught up. These little houses, you will not need over 100 gallons of propane to heat any one of them for the whole winter season. You will not need over one cord, two ricks of wood, $80. When we looked at those 17 houses, eight of them were still using wood for backup heat. Four of the eight were cutting their own firewood. Had zero energy cost for winter heating through that effort. We asked them, has it changed and affected the lives of the children? Where the children were present, and, uh, and if not with parents. And the response was from the kids. We're not ashamed for our friends to know where we live and to have them come over. In terms of socialization, we talked about the number of increasing number of friends that the kids had. Uh, parents talked about having behavioral problems that they were going to the school like once a quarter at least and saying we've not been to school at all. Uh, we had academic kind of in improvement within the kids and that's been our priority with children in the houses, hoping we can get them into a better study environment in a place where they take more pride in themselves and where uh, they relate uh, more effectively with, with their peers, and hopefully that'll give them a, a, a better uh, perspective on, on what they can become and what they can achieve uh, in their lives. Clearly, the Upper Sand Mountain Parish presents us with a pattern of more than just handing out free food. The thought and compassion behind each aspect of this ministry is amazing. We just can't say it enough. This is what can be done when people come together, work together, and love together. The next part of our journey was presented by one of our classmates through his own life experience. Robert loves to hunt, and he shared with us the problem of the overpopulation of the deer herd in Alabama. Okay, we're here in the woods with some of Northeast Alabama's local hunters. We're going to ask them a few questions about how they feel they can feed the hungry. Yes. So, Robert, how would uh, a hunter go about doing this, you know, helping the hungry? What, is, what are some of the things, talk about some of the things that he could do, or she, you know, we don't want to be sexist <laughs> right, here. Right, because there are female hunters. There are female there are, hunters, yeah, so, exactly. You know, we'll be so, uh, sexually biased. Anyways, just tell us a little bit about how maybe, you know, a hunter could get out there and help these poor hungry people. In the okay, world. well, uh, I had talked to Craig Hill last night on the telephone and he was talking about the hunters helping the hungry in Alabama and of course to do that you need the processors and uh, he said that basically all the processor has to do is call him or send him a like a letterhead or something to get qualified and they'll send him some forms and then they've got to have a food bank so the upper sand mountain parish for like the Calvin Jackson County would be our food bank and all that they have to do too is like send a letterhead and tell how tell what their organization's about and how many people that they help to serve. It's, uh, it's founded through a foundation, a conservation foundation in the state, which was formed uh, probably in the year 2001. And we raise money for Hunters Helping the Hungry program. 
uh, which is a program where a hunter can donate his deer if he doesn't want the meat. The meat will be processed, given to a food bank or a church group, and the foundation will pay the processor for processing this meat. It started in 1999, I believe, with uh, about 25 processors involved in the program. Uh, this year we have uh, 66 processors involved in the program, and to date we have uh, furnished around 230,000 pounds of meat to uh, church groups or food banks uh, you know, to distribute to the needy for food. So how many, how many deer, I mean, I mean, how many people can one deer feed? You could easily get 80 or 90 pounds of meat out of it easily. Wow. Yeah. Not only yeah. that, it uh, helps get on, like with the animal rights activists, uh, with that deer overpopulating, at least uh, this is going toward, toward a good cause, helping right. feed yeah. the hungry, you know. Exactly, and, uh, exactly. It kind of gets them on board with hunting more so they won't be so against the hunters. Right, because I used to be against hunting right. until I heard about this idea. Exactly. And now I'm like, you know, they were put here for a reason right. to feed people. So that's, that's one thing, that's you know, people do. can't use that as an excuse anymore, you know. Exactly. Hey, these hunters are out here killing these animals for no reason. Exactly. But right here's a reason, you know, exactly. hunger. They're out there feeding You know, animals. hunter hunters for hunger is boom, that's it. That's, that's the it. idea. You sea know? bass and the guys here. Sea bass and the guys yeah. here, you know. Sea bass. That's, that's <laughs> big yeah. bird man truck. You know, this has been it's really been informative situation, I, yeah. you know. When I first came on board in Montgomery, uh, I, I did not, I had no idea the demand was out there as it is. And, and the food banks that we've talked to uh, just say that they can take all the meat that we can give them. So we have uh, geared ourselves to raise the money uh, not to shut this program down, to process as many deer, and, and it's twofold. The main purpose is to help the hunger, of course. Uh, it also helps manage our deer population because uh, in, in a lot of cases, we do have severe overpopulation in the state of Alabama. This allows people to manage the herd, harvest the deer, and have something to do with the deer and feel good about themselves because they're helping other people in donating this meat. So it's been successful. We're uh, to the point monetarily now that we're financially secure in it. So if we have really started promoting this program with the hunters as well as the processors. We learned a lot today about, you know, hunting and, and extra deer and everything. Exactly. Right. Just people, you know, I didn't know this, but, you know, we're telling people now about what they can do. Right. It's like Robert said earlier, you know, he kills 25 deer, Yeah. you know, a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, he takes 20 of those deer and donates them to people. Right. For, they, can you know, feed, they can feed a lot of people. It's amazing how many how many people they can yeah. feed. I mean, know? it's not, it's not going to be an easy process. Exactly. You know, getting this undergo, but, you know, if we have organization. But if every, you know, if, right. every, if every hunter gets out there, yeah. And donates their time. I mean, what? They have to sign it, you know, sign a few papers to turn the deer over. That's all it's it takes. It's a simple process. Exactly. We just need to get it going. Exactly. But, so, uh, but, you know, the people got to know it. It's up to you. Right. To get it, it is done. up to you it's to get this done. Get that we, done. We appreciate you guys sitting with us, talking with us today. Exactly. It's been fun. It has you know, been fun. Hope you guys, you know, have a prosperous hunting, hunting season. season. Exactly. You know, so, uh, you know, good luck. Good luck with the, the bow. You have to teach me how to shoot that in a little <laughs> bit. <laughs>it seems like the food always tasted better at Grandma's house. Now we're going to take a look back in time. We're actually going to advocate the return of the small family farm in our journey to end hunger. Jackson County school system as of the year 2005, uh, our, we have an enrollment of approximately 6,000 students, of which 59% are free or reduced students. 
therefore that many families are below the poverty level. We started a summer feeding program uh, eight years ago and uh, this past summer uh, we served 12,000 meals in the month of June. Now in the summer for students to come eat the summer feeding meals that we provide they have to provide their own transportation. So to serve 12,000 meals in one month in a rural county like we are to children that are having to provide their own transportation tells me that there is a there's a big need. Uh, a lot of these kids are not are not getting to eat at home or at least not to get getting to eat enough. There's a child obesity problem across the US and Alabama unfortunately is number one in the nation in child obesity and uh, the US Department of Agriculture has targeted child obesity as a problem that needs to be corrected and when they reauthorized the Child Nutrition Act 2004 they put in place that all school districts now have to have a wellness policy starting in, in the year, school year 2006-2007. Basically what that means is each school system has to come up with a plan to show that they're taking action to help uh, fight off child obesity. And by uh, some of the ways they're doing that is by changing menus in the lunchrooms, by doing away with the sale of carbonated drinks in elementary schools, uh, limiting the items that can be sold for snacks, and uh, making sure that milk is all milk sold now is one percent fat or less, and that was you know pretty big change. In Alabama, we have a half a million people in Alabama diagnosed with diabetes. We have another two hundred thousand people that has diabetes that has not been diagnosed, and one out of ten of those are children. You know, Alabama leads the nation in obesity. And I think that's absolutely ridiculous that, that we in government are not going to make the right decisions to change that. So if we don't get a handle on these problems, our health care system in Alabama is not going to be able to burden the cost. But not only that, our children are going to be unhealthy. You know, the one thing that really disturbed me is when statistics come out and say that this generation of children won't outlive us, then that's something that, that I don't think that we can set back and stand for. We've got to make sure that our children are healthy and that they do outlive us. And through these proper managements and outreach, I think we can do that. Uh, there is a strong need uh, for us to provide nutritious meals for students. Unfortunately, there's a lot of students that the only nutritious meal they will receive is what they receive at school. So therefore, you know, we, we need to be, lead the way by serving nutritious meals and we need to try to educate the students and hopefully educate the parents how to eat nutritiously at home. We have a little dream. We're, we're dreaming about a time uh, that used to be where a family could have a small farm and sell their, their uh, produce to the local schools so our kids could be eating better. Is that a, is that a ridiculous dream? No, it's a good dream and he could, and he could very well happen if you had four or five small farmers that wanted to get hooked up with, like right here in DeKalb County, we have, I think it's eight high schools and, and uh, uh, three elementary schools here in this county. Of course, of course you have four Plain City schools. and uh, But four or, five, four or five farmers, if they wanted to and could get hooked up with the, and have a guarantee that they would take the stuff, they would be much better off to buy it like that than they would to buy it shipped in. I think, it, I think it's an excellent idea. Our community certainly has many needs, and our journey to end hunger has led us down many paths. We're going to make three assertions. It's a statement made with confidence. Uh. <laughs> Number one, every human being has a right to have access to the food they need to live. Number two, the quality of our food is in question, both in terms of the world food supply and in our personal choices. Number three, we need to get back to being Americans, industrious and self-reliant. All across America, people are turning back to the good earth and discovering life itself. We have selected a few scenes from a documentary called Young Agrarians for your viewing pleasure to demonstrate what we've been talking about. The doors have been slammed so firmly uh, on the entree into agriculture. You know, I mean, we have farmers' sons and daughters that aren't able to stay on their own farm. So,
to talk about somebody getting in when we can't even stop those that are on the farm from going out uh, is extremely problematic and I think simply uh, shows the, um, uh, the seeming intractableness of the problem. I live on a fourth generation family farm and then I went to school in the city to get as far away from agriculture as I possibly could. I couldn't stand the thought of farming because I saw so many farmers going out of business, not able to make payments on their houses, they lost their farms. It's, it seemed like kind of a dead-end job. Well, when I first got to California and I first arrived in Santa Cruz, it was like a complete culture shock to me. The first thing I noticed is that all the young people my age, in their 20s and early 30s, were really interested in farming. And I met some really wonderful young people who were farming. And, and it's, they were having so much fun and they were, they were successful and they were they had small farms. They didn't live on huge thousand, two thousand acre farms that you usually think of when you think of a successful, viable farm. They were farming ten to twenty acres. And they were they were providing food for people in the city, food for the people in their communities, and it was all organic and fresh. And they were really excited about it. And their farms were gorgeous and beautiful and they had all kinds of things growing, not just corn and not just beans and they were making money from it. And they weren't getting rich, obviously, but that their quality of life was just so much greater than a lot of the farms that I saw where I lived. So I thought, well, I might look at farming again and maybe try to see what I can do with agriculture as a career. I mean, I, I got my hands dirty because it felt good. And I started growing things because it just made so much sense. and. I mean, in every sense of that word, I mean, it felt good. It's the, the flavor of the products that, that grew from my own hands tasted wonderful. Um, I had a better understanding of what it took to maintain myself, um, to be more self-reliant. And most of my friends who were farm kids were going in the opposite direction. My best friend in high school, you know, 11 kids, a uh, farming family, and None of them except one stayed in agriculture and he became an engineer. Typically it's man over matter and you know we're either going to have you know a bigger piece of equipment, a stronger chemical, you know, a more water soluble fertilizer, whatever it is it's going to be some product that's going to allow us to enhance what the biology gives us or what we take from the biology. And agriculture in general is stuck in that paradigm. They're stuck in a tradition and a, and a perspective that needs a nudge. Producing your own food is so much, so much better because it has so many less steps. Like, I mean, if you look at the food that's grown in the stores and you think, how many steps has this gone through? How many people were shipped across the country to grow this food, to use, um, like machinery that was shipped across the country that had to use fuel that was shipped across the world. I mean, there's like tons and tons and tons of different resources that are being used unnecessarily to grow food. And when people could be growing it in their own backyard or in their own community and they could be sharing the, the wonderful knowledge and the, the friendships that are built around gardening and growing your own food. Well, you can, you can see it in their faces when they, when they first learn how to harvest the different kinds of plants that they planted themselves and they're like wow I ate that last night and it was so cool and I mean people really recognize the fact that this food is going to the community and realizing that their friends are eating this food and I know that most of the youth want to come back the next year and they want to continue working here because it's it's really it looks good on a job application it's really good for the soul to be working in the dirt and I know most of the kids feel really good about the work that they're doing take to get back to doing the locally grown, you know, agriculture? Well, first you have a basis of people that's capable of producing the food, uh, which I think we still have that available. Uh, that opportunity has been taken away from a lot of people, though, because of the fact they couldn't market their products. However, if there was an opportunity for people to market products uh, through a 
something like our school system, I think a lot of people would be interested in it. Right, they could still be successful sure. and do stuff yes. like that, yeah. But if they had a market. But, right. you know, vertical integration has taken that market away from so many people. For instance, the vertical integration of the poultry industry and now the uh, the egg industry. What, what do you mean by vo vertical integration? Vertical, uh, vertical integration is where a large company owns the product from the very start all the way to it's marketed to the uh, to the consumer. That cuts out the individual ownership of the, of the person who which owned the land, who owned the uh, animals. It cut out the man who was making the feed and selling to these individuals. So now instead of those people, it goes from a company who owns the animals and just you and I would work for them. Right. Exactly. And then they take, there's no middleman in this. Well, right. they're, they're, Basically yeah. they're taking all those jobs away from the small man. Yeah. Right. The, that opportunity for the small man is not there anymore. And that the reason that happened was because the market went away. However, an advantage I would see would also be the activity that could be used you know, when the farm family was here, everybody had a, a job to do on the farm. For instance, when I grew up, we got out the first six weeks of school, half day, to pick cotton. That was just the way it went. First six weeks of school, you got out at lunch to go home and pick cotton or pimento pepper. Yeah. And, and children got exercise there and they worked on the farm. Today, that opportunity is not there. Children do not have, well, they're not needed. Right. Exactly. You know, so they because once again the small man's been taken. The small away. man's gone. So if we could recoup that somehow and provide an opportunity for the small man, then he could engage his children and his family in producing this food, which in turn would provide a, you know an opportunity for them to get exercise, be involved in the process. I believe in conjunction with food and just the physical work could sure help the beastie of a lot of children. See from the greenhouse here, one of the things when I came to this school was to get in agriculture more involved with the students here. For instance, many of the students are not raised in an agricultural environment anymore because the opportunity is gone. Yeah, exactly. So we use the greenhouse here to get children involved to know how to grow plants. Now. I was hoping we'd be able to buy the property right back here, but it didn't come through. I wanted to plant a vineyard so the children would be able to grow fruit, and then we might could take that fruit and take it to the home economics department, let them make the jellies and jams, and use it here at the school. We, we started a program to where we go out and buy Alabama produce, Alabama fruits and vegetables, and put them on every child's plate in Alabama. For an example, we buy peaches from Chilton County. We buy apples from Crow Mountain in Jackson County. We buy sweet potatoes in Coleman. We buy satsuma, mandarin oranges in Mobile and Baldwin County. And we brought up to a million dollars worth of product from, from family farms to put on the plates of our children in Alabama. I think it's a great program. Number one, it's a quality product. Number two, it keeps profitability back in the small family farm. And we're gonna continue that program, it's important. The school system has worked very well with us. We work with the uh, Alabama school system and also the Department of Defense. And the reason the Department of Defense is involved in this is because they have a buying mechanism. There's criteria and guidelines that you gotta go under. There's gotta be partic particular sizes. There's gotta be quality. There's gotta be, you gotta make sure that if you need this many servings throughout Alabama, every child's gotta have one. Half of them can't and half of them won't but you've got to have servants for everybody. So it's a, it's, a, it's a complex program, but it's been very successful. Our farmers have been very supportive and uh, we're gonna continue that program to make sure that we put fruits and vegetables in the, in the schools of Alabama. Direct marketing in, in, through farmers markets, uh, that's one way farmers are making more money. Um, and developing relationships in the community. Another way is through community supported agriculture, CSAs, where people in the community buy a share of the farm at the beginning of the season. So they sort of assume the risk with the farmer. They, they pay the farmer up front and then the farmer has that money at the beginning of the season when it's actually much better for the farmer to have the money anyway. 
I think that there's agricultural opportunities, not just in the countryside also, but in the city as well. There's um, organizing communities around farmers, and that's a whole side of agriculture that I don't think we've yet tapped, is coming at agriculture from the other side, from the consumer. In this country, we, there used to be um, many, many farmers. Um, now there's only, it's only 2% of the country is farmers. There's fewer and fewer farmers, and the farm population is aging. And so we need new farmers if we want to see that um, farm, those farm opportunities available in the future for young people. If we don't learn this, who's going to teach us? I mean, if we are the future, if we're the ones who have to take control and say, I, this is how I want my world to run, this is how I want my earth to look, I want to be able to have trees, and I want to be able to breathe, and I want to have water that's clean and fresh, and I want to be able to eat, eat healthy food. Food is for all of us, and we all need it. We all have a right to have access to it. It's extremely important to buy local. Number one, you know what you get. You know that you buy it, you're going to carry it home, it's safe to eat. You know that, it, that in most cases it's not going to have chemicals put on it that, that some other country or, or human wastewater that, that they use to fertilize their, their products. It's extremely important. Uh, it's worth more to buy from your farmer's market or your farmer to know exactly you know, what you're getting. But most farmers are, are within the market. They, they, they are very competitive. Uh, if you look at their product, you know, I've said it all along. There's a lot of difference between a tomato sandwich on a tomato that's grown here in DeKalb County than they are one shipped in from California. I'm not going to eat one of them. But you wait till the tomato season comes in, uh, you're going to have to beat me away from the table. There's a difference. There's a difference in a peach in Chilton County that stays on the tree longer uh, with more sugar being involved into that fruit than it is being picked green and then shipped here and go through a process. They're just not good products. So there is a difference in food that is grown in Alabama versus food that would be grown in other parts of the world and possibly even distant areas in the United States. There's times of the year that you're going to have to buy other products because of the weather and geographical locations that we are. But also there's times of the year that we can support local agriculture and we ought to do that. And I encourage it and we promote it. And uh, I think you'll find out that that's, that that's the best buy you could probably get. That would be wonderful. Uh, it really would. As a matter of fact, part of the local wellness policy is that we have to serve more fresh fruits and vegetables. Now, of course, we order through a grocery company that's picked by the state of Alabama, but uh, it would be wonderful if, if we had local uh, farmers that could provide us produce at a, you know, that was fresh and, and uh, safe and, and reasonably priced. That would be great. If a man doesn't have a place to market his produce or his products, then why would he grow them? Right. But now right. if you could grow them, as you're talking about, and use them here, that would be an excellent opportunity. People right. would seize that. But it would be great. It would be great for the farmers. It would be great for the school system and, 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 and especially the children. That's, that's the ones that you want to really think about as the kids. And, uh, if it ever happened, I would really like to get tied up with it and, and uh, be involved in it big time. I think we need to get a look at the bigger picture because feeding people today is not going to solve the problem for the future. Governments have a lot to do with it and I don't understand it all yet, but I do know that every law they make in Washington will eventually affect me. There's so much to learn about the NAFTA and CAFTA trade agreement stuff. I went to Honduras in February to train people to do my job and got laid off in August because they can do it so much cheaper. One of our projects was to examine the importance of awareness. Yeah, keeping up with what's going on in Montgomery and Washington. Let's go back to the class. I was out shopping the other day in Huntsville and along the side of the road I saw a homeless person. I felt so horrible for him. You know, big cities aren't the only places. Just the other day, I saw a man on the off-ramp in Fort Payne holding a sign saying, we'll work for food. There are many ways you can let your voice be heard. I let my voice be heard by going to one.org to sign a petition saying, I believe we can end hunger in this generation. If we just become more politically active and vote, we can change things. Very, very important that you go and get registered to vote. You say, why, why is it important? Don't, it's not important. 
uh, I'm busy, I've got to worry about my education, I've got to worry about getting married. All of the reasons, if, if your education is important, then it's important to vote. If getting married or if, uh, and having children is important, it's important to vote. Guess what? Uh, government and what I do affects every one of your lives, every waking minute that you're awake. And you can either be a part of that process and vote for the people that will do you a good job, or you can just drift along like so many people do and say, oh, somebody else can take care of it. When they take care of it, they'll take care of it to their liking, not necessarily to your liking. Let me tell you about writing uh, your elected official. Well, the most important thing, I get hundreds and sometimes thousands of letters. And oftentimes they're, uh, they're the same letter. Some, some group has put out this same letter, it says the same thing, and they pass them around in a group and everybody signs their name to it. When I get a stack of those things, I read the first one and I throw them all in a big old mass bundle in the waste can. I'm not going to sit there and read the same piece of junk 400 times or 100 times. But now if you want to uh, have some impact with your governor, your state official such as me, your county commissioner, t take a pen or a pencil and sit down and pen out a couple of paragraphs. Now don't write me five or six long scribbling, rambling pages or anybody else. No one will read it. But if, you're, if you'll uh, write out a couple of legible, sensible paragraphs, I will read every word of that and all the other elected officials will too. You know, in Alabama today, we know where our ties come from, we know where our shirts, we know where our suits, we know where our VCRs, we know where our TVs, we know where everything in our house comes from but our food. And I think we need a country of origin labeling for the simple fact that if you want to buy something from Guatemala, have at it. But they also have an opportunity to buy something from the USA. And we've had some resistance there, and, and, and I think that if we could get a little nudge and educate our legislators, I think that they would be supportive of a country of origin labeling. It's something that I'm certainly interested in. Got to remember that all of the products that are shipped into this country, less than 3% of them are inspected. So that puts a heavy burden on the Department of Agriculture to try to make sure that that happens. And uh, so, you know, I encourage, uh, I encourage people to uh, strongly support country of origin labeling. And I, I certainly import, uh, encourage them to support nutrition programs that we've talked about with our children. But we will respond. Uh, most of your elected officials are good elected officials. They try hard. Now, we don't have enough money to solve all the problems. Just like I was talking about, be involved. Make it a point to be involved. It'll make your county, your area, your state your nation a much better place to live. Don't, don't let everybody else drive the, uh, the boat. You need to be the captain of your boat. And you can't do that unless you vote. Maybe where we are headed with our look at ending hunger locally is not just meeting the needs of people that are in trouble. No, it seems that going back to the principles of becoming self-sufficient, the community taking care of itself may be a big part of the solution. The government's definitely not going to help us. No, they're undependable and overextended as it is. And although we need to keep aware of what our leaders are always up to, make our voice heard. We are the ones who elected them. And you didn't vote, didn't you? Did you? Our conclusion is that we need to learn more. Be on top of it. Watch the news. Talk to your local officials. We need to support local community businesses. Buy local as much as possible. We've got to get involved, take care of our own by working together. Because you never know when the one in need might be you. Like someone once said, you can get out there and help to create your own future. Or you can sit at home and wait for it to happen to you. I want to be the one out there making it happen, creating my own future. How, How about, about you? you?